boy, do we have a surprise for you this morning. Look on the piano back here. Brother Luke is joining the praise team today. We're so excited to have him with us. Would you stand? We welcome you to the Vidalia Church of God. We sing for one purpose, to welcome the presence of the Lord into the house. So join us today. I'm casting my cares aside. I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart. from Psalms 91 this morning. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I will trust Him for He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, Though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see 
how the wicked are punished. If you made the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call upon me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. You know, those are, that is the divine protection of God. If we would take hold of those promises right there, if we would, we should walk in here shouting because if we take hold of these promises that the Lord will, He's protecting us, divine protection. Uh, welcome everybody this morning. Um, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. If AJ, if you, he's got a uh, prayer request up there. Let's remember um, our church family that stand in need of prayer and our um, friends and family members of our church family. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you, Father, Lord, we honor you and we glorify and we praise you, Father. If we would again, if we would just take hold of those promises, that's just one book of the Bible where you give us those that divine protection that no matter what may be going on around us, no matter what may, may be going on in our personal lives, Lord, that you are protecting and you are keeping us, Father. Lord, let us take hold this morning of those things, Lord. Let us take hold of the other promises, the divine promises in your word this morning, God. Father, I pray, Lord, that you anoint the word. Brother Ronnie Lucas, it comes forth today that you would touch our ears and our hearts to receive your word, Father. Lord, touch each and every member of our church and every, Father, person that is in this room today or maybe watching online, Father, those that stand in need of prayer that are on our prayer list Lord God you see the sickness in their bodies you need the you see the touch that they need father you see this world that is wicked outside the doors of this house today God we need deliverance father in our world in our nation today God and I pray Lord that you would help us to stand upon your word to take that authority that we have in your word and in and through your Holy Spirit today, Father. God, I pray, Lord, again, that you would be with us, Father. Lord, have your hand upon us. Lord, these next few songs and this next word, and we give it all glory and all honor and all praise to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Sister Robin, for that word. You may be seated. Just want to remind you of our ways to give. We have ways to give. We have a giving station in the back. You can drop your tithe and offering in. You can go online. You can drop it by the church, mail it in. Uh, just so thank you so much for all that you do for the kingdom of God, uh, for everything that we can do. And if you'll notice our playground, we're getting getting further along. It's, it's looking good. Got the sand. Uh, got that put in this week and I'm not sure really if there's more going to be done to it a little bit more, a little bit more got to uh, be done but we just thank God for that and, and without you without you none of this could be done so we just we thank you for, for doing that uh, at this time we're going to have our announcements uh, so won't you just uh, pay attention to the screen and, and watch our announcements for the week Good morning. We are glad you're here to worship with us today. If you are a guest, we want to connect with you. You can fill out the connect card that is in the pew in front of you, or on the bulletin you received, you can scan the QR code with your cell phone. You can also go to our webpage at vidaliachurch.org and click on connect at the top right-hand corner. We also have a gift waiting for you at the Welcome Center in the foyer. We look forward to seeing all of you at our next service. 
Summer is about over, and that means it's time to think about going back to school. Our back to school bash is scheduled for Wednesday, August the 2nd at 6.30 p.m. The night promises to be a fun, fun night for sure. Wednesday, August the 2nd. The South Georgia Senior Adult Day will be Saturday, August the 12th in Baxley. This day promises to be a great day of worship and fellowship. A sign-up sheet is at the Welcome Center to let us know you are going. You can put your $20 registration fee in an envelope and mark it Senior Adult Day. The deadline to register and get your money in is Sunday, August the 6th. Students, plans are complete for your fall retreat at Lake St. Clair, September the 15th to the 17th. Your $60 fee is due by August the 27th. Talk with Pastor Brandy with any questions you may have. You can stay up to date on our many activities by logging on to one of our social media platforms. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us today. Should you need the staff at any time, please give us a call. Phone numbers are in your bulletin. We look forward to seeing you at our next service. Have a good week. Stand with us again if you would.
this morning that he's good. Would you let him know in your way? We praise you, Father. We thank you, Jesus.
How many knows he's your present help? Every time we in need, we just call on him. We'll give everybody, give somebody a high five, shake their hand, hug their neck, uh, fist bump or something, do something. Let them know it's good to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. You can be seated. And we've got, we've got even, even another special treat this morning. We're going to have Sister Beverly Luke is going to come and sing a song. And I'm going to let them tell you the little story behind, behind this. So I'm not going to spoil that. But they're going to come right now. So if you will, just give Brother and Sister Luke a, a hand. I don't know how good it is to have them. Amen. Can, can you hear me? Because I can't hear me. Put me some sound on me in this earpiece up here. Amen. It is, it's a joy to be with you today. We've enjoyed last week, a few weeks back that we were here. Uh, my wife has sung. Some of you that have been to camp meet have heard her sing for, for eons. I was at church a few weeks ago and somebody introduced me to some new people there. I played the organ that morning and somebody had said something about me and she said, this is Brother Sister Luke. Said they, They've been pastoring for uh, 108 years. <laughs> so so if, if, you, if you've lived in the past 108 years, you know, no. But uh, my wife has not sung solo in church uh, since COVID. And everywhere we go, they want to hear her sing. And, uh, so uh, if, if her voice cracks, just say, stick it, devil. And go on. We're going we're gonna to let her sing. I, I have a mental block. You get 70, almost 71, you get something in your mind, and you, you want to play the wrong song. I did this in rehearsal.
monitor this day and all I ever have is inner ear problems so I'm not used to that <laughs> I'm used to listening with my ears matter of fact I can't hear today because so many years of camp meeting we didn't know anything about an inner ear monitor so they sit one right beside you and with all the people shouting and running and hooping and hollering you had to turn it wide open so I'm about deaf in one ear and can't hear out the other one but I'm doing okay. That, that, that song means so much to us because I, I thought I asked her to sing it, and I was going to say this a while ago, and I don't want to take any extra time. For uh, 70 days or so, she laid in the hospital, and uh, she couldn't pray. She couldn't do anything. But he was there. God just had to excuse me. God is our refuge. He's a present help in trouble. And he's been so real and so good to us. I am so happy again today to be with you. Be my last time for God knows how long. Unless your new pastor decides he wants me to come back and preach sometime. But, but I have thoroughly enjoyed being here. I got a, mas uh, a message from your former pastor this morning. About the time I drove up. And he was very kind. He said, I'm so glad you're there to take care of things while I've been gone. So uh, appreciate and love Wayne and Kim Merritt. And, and we'll talk about other things as we get along. I want to, if you would, to turn with me to the, the book of Romans. I want to preach to you if you put my, my uh, I'm still carrying something with me. Why, why didn't y'all tell me? Why didn't y'all tell me? God, let me go back here. I jerked the pack off in the floor. <laughs> Let me see. I gotta plug this in because I'm gonna use it later on. Is it right here on the back, somebody help me. Is this the right spot? I'm not tech I'm not technically challenged. I'm just challenged to <laughs> fix it for me, young man. God, he was a kid in youth camp. Now they got grandkids. It makes me mad. You boy, you, you this right here, you can't stop it. Time just keeps running by. I want to preach to you an, an unusual message this morning. I hope you don't think it's crazy. I'm not going to preach anything like I preached last week. I had a purpose in last week's message. But I want to preach to you on, do we have it up there? Yes, a simple, a simple gospel. Let me read the text if you put my text up for me. Romans 16, uh, chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And if you go over in the Old Testament, you find that. And if you look, and I heard Pastor Danny McEachin, who was one of the great Bible scholars I ever knew, he said, when you boil that down to the original Hebrew, it says, just live faith. And there's no other way to please God is it than to live faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege, Lord, of, of being with us uh, together in this house today. You've done so many good things for us all. Thank you. I thank you, first of all, for my wife and for her, to, for me to get to hear her voice 
as she sang about you and know God that we're not singing words, we're singing things out that we have lived in our lives. This is no longer just a story that I read in a book, God. It is the reality of my life, and I thank you for that. Please help me for the next few minutes. Help me to keep it, if I can, to that. What I believe you, you laid on my heart, I, I, I wrestled back into this week and the week trying to figure out exactly, but this is where I settled. And I believe it's because you have a plan for what we are going to say today. Please touch our hearts. Please touch our lives. And bless this church as they move forward in the work of God. May the things that happen in weeks to come be in perfect accordance to your will. We pray as Jesus prayed, not our will, but your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to preach to you, as I said, my sermon title was a simple gospel. I ask you a question, or two or three questions. Why are we here today? I mean, it's good lake weather, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things you could be doing. Why are you here? Why do we rehearse? I was laying in bed this morning at about, I didn't look at the clock, but it had to be about 629, and I thought, I was already awake. I said, oh, that phone's fixing to go off, and i got to get up. About that time, it went off, and I said, I told over, told over to my wife, I looked at her, and I said, well, I just said the clock's about to go off, so we, we got up early. We came over, and we, we rehearsed, and we sung. Why do we, why do we do that? Why do you tithe? Why do you give your good money that you work hard for to a church? Why do you reach in above your tithe sometimes and give to missions or some other thing? You, you, you give money that... And I try never to think of it like this. I, when I take my tithe check, and I'll take it by my church tomorrow because I won't get to be there next week either. I got to go have, I got a difficult job next weekend. That's keeping grandbabies. Praise God for that, you know. I get to see them again. But I put, I promise you, I go by and tell my pastor, I won't be here next week, but I brought my money. He said, as long as you keep the money coming, that's fine. <laughs> Why do we do that? That's a big chunk of money every month. What? Why do we devote so much of our time, busy time? Anybody here busy? Well, we've got one or two honest people here, and the rest of you are lazy. <laughs> why, why do we give our time to the church? Isn't it for the sake of the gospel? Don't we do it for the gospel? Jesus said this gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end will come. Church of God's been involved in a, a program called the Finnish Commitment, trying to get the message to every unreached people group in the world. We're doing a fair job, but we're not doing the complete job. Jesus, in his last commission to the church, said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's important because of what it says next. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe, he who does not believe will be condemned. Our, our, our business is to preach the gospel. I, I told the, the choir by the praise team, well, I have an something happened to me this morning. It never happened to me. I went downstairs in the, in the Holiday Inn to get some, I had already, uh, Fixed up and smeared my face real good. I don't always put on smell good. Sometimes I, I just don't do that. But on Sunday morning, I try to at least keep from stinking when I come to the house of God. And I put on, and two of the employees in the, in the uh, hotel come by me and they said, is that you? That's usually a scary thing when people ask you that. <laughs> then one of them took a plate and she said, yeah, that's him, that's him. I said, what is it? They said, what have you got on? I thought about saying clothes. I, I, I said, you, you smell so good. Now, I ain't never had nobody tell me that, I don't think. If I have, I, I sure didn't do it not in the presence of my wife. So I was nervous as long tail cat in a room full of rocket chairs. And I told them, I said, well, I got on marble. It come from uh, Bath and Body Works. She said, oh, it's my favorite store. I didn't know they had that. I'm getting some from my man. I said, well, good, good. I got my pancakes and I went out and sat down and went up in the room and immediately told my wife what had transpired. And 
I ain't getting in trouble at this age of life. I'm going to tell you. So I walked back downstairs, and she was with me, and the other, that they were standing there at the desk, and one of them said, oh, well, you smell good too. She said, I heard y'all been uh, uh, bragging on my husband this morning. And one of the ladies looked over and said to her, what do y'all do? And she said, we're pastors. And I'm talking about she didn't get out her mouth till, till, till one of the ladies looked up at me and said, I need prayer. Could you pray for me now? And her and the other lady come out, and we shared a prayer with them. And I looked, and both of them had tears running down their faces. The gospel is good wherever you go. Sometimes you have to tell it. Maybe sometimes you just have to smell it. I don't know. But be always ready to give every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that lies within your heart. Now the gospel has been dissected, scrutinized, sermonized, criticized to the point that sometimes we make it so difficult you need a Ph.D. Now back when I was in my early days of, of Pentecost and, and preaching, I had a Ph.D., I had a lot of hair, and it was piled high and deep. That's my Ph.D. But you don't need that to understand the gospel. I want to give you, have you ever heard the term binary truths? Binary truths? That's two statements that go parallel to each other. So I want to give you three binary truths this morning and then a closing statement. In other words, I just want to give you 27 simple words that tell us what the gospel is. If you put my next slide up there. This is simply it. This is the gospel. There is a God. Binary truth. There is a devil. Second group, there's a heaven. We don't like the next verse or line. There's a hell. Then, man is a sinner. You believe that? But Jesus is a savior. And here's the sentence that ties it all together. You must decide. I hope everybody here is a Christian today, but if you're not, I'm preaching to you. And if you are a Christian, I want to give you something so simple. Anybody can remember that. That's 27 words. I went to, to, to 12th grade English and I had to learn the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. I ran across somebody the other day and, uh, and I started on it and she joined in with me. One that April with the shore so to the droop to march that pierced to the road and bathed every vein in switch liqueur of which virtue engendered is the floor. One zephyr sect with his spirit holy breath that hath in every holt and hath the tender croppets and the youngest son that hath in the ram is how of course he And I could finish it, but I won't because you ain't understood a word I've said. <laughs> but if I can remember that, you can remember this. There's a God, there's a devil. There's a heaven, there's a hell. Man is a sinner. Jesus is a savior, and you got to decide. Let's look at the next one. There is a God. How many believe there's a God? Amen. Amen. The Bible said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And God saw the light that it was good and he divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it try to prove that God exists? I think the Bible and God's word simply assumes that anybody that had half a brain and two-thirds of an intellect would decide that we are not here by chance. We didn't just happen to be here. You look around at the earth and the beauty of it, and I've traveled across the sea. I've been to some islands. I've been in 41 of the different 50 states, and, and it, they're all different, and, and it seems like whoever did this just did not run out of creative ability, but yet there are people who want to look at you today and say there is no God, and this all happened by chance. Well, I wore my genuine see it on a cruise ship, but buy it off of QVC, Invicta watch today. I didn't wear my Apple watch. I wore my Invicta. If I were to disassemble this, 
put the tiny pieces in a cloth bag and shake it, how long do you think it would take for it to come together like this? Do you believe it would ever come together like this? And then somebody comes along and tells me that all the harmony and unity and beauty of creation and the intricacies of, of human life and animal life and plant life and sea life and all this stuff just happened? Oh no, when you look and you walk out and you look in the sky today and you look across the, 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 uh, the I guess the onion fields are empty, but when you look across the fields and the trees and stuff and you look at that, I, I want you just to think one thing. There is a God. There is a God. A God. Not some gods. I don't want to be looped in with a Buddhist and his million gods. I don't want to be looped in with a Muslim and his definition of God because it's not the God of the Bible. They may say that it is, but it's not because he don't operate in the same thing. And he said, I am the Lord and I change not. There is a God. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now you say, well, you got God the Father and God the Son. Where does that come in? Right there. He said, thus says the Lord and his Redeemer. So Jesus Christ is mentioned there. There, there, there is a God. But as surely as there is a God, people don't like to talk about this, but there is a devil. You believe there is a devil? I believe I've run across him a time or two in my life. Now, you may think he lives at your house, but he doesn't. You may think the devil's giving you a hard time all the time, but most of the time he's not because there's only one devil and he can only be in one place. He first appears in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden and the last time we're going to ever see him is in the book of Revelation chapter uh, 20 and verse 10 when he is put in the lake of fire. Genesis says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, this is the way the devil does work. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And a woman said to the serpent, well, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor touch it, lest you die. God just said, do not eat of it. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. And the serpent said, this is how the devil talks, yeah, you, you won't really die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan's plan then was to get man to follow him in the same rebellion that got him kicked out of heaven in ages past. One of my favorite chapters is Isaiah 14 and 12 where, where the, the prophet's writing and he says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning. That means he was a, a, an angel of great beauty and height. How are you cut down? You did weak the nations. You said, I'll ascend into heaven. You know, the, the biggest thing that gets people in trouble today is I. Is the attitude that I am at the center of this universe. That's where Satan was, at least he wanted to be. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I'll be like the most high. And then God speaks back to him and said, yet. That's a great word right there. You may be in the midst of the biggest mess you've ever been in your life, but you look at your mess and whoever's bringing on you, if it's the devil or whatever, say, yet. I will praise him who is the hope of my salvation. God said, you got all these thoughts, all these plans, all these big to-dos, but yet you'll be brought down to hell to the lowest depths of the pit. I, I often, you know here, the next time we have a school shooting, the next time we have a big hurricane that tears something up, the next time a tornado goes through one of our villages and towns and people are dying, the next time there's a plague like, uh, what did we just have, COVID? somebody's going to know, find out you're a Christian, and they're going to say, if there is a God, am I right? Why did he let this happen? Well, I can answer that in four words. There is a 
devil. And Jesus was very clear about him and his plans. The thief comes but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If you leave it there, that's a sad epitome to be written upon the tombstone of man. But Jesus went on to say, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Would somebody put your hands together with me and just praise God for the promise? I like to think of Satan as being a lame duck ruler. You know what that is, don't you? We'll have a presidential election next November. If, and, and this is not what I'm advocating, but I want to say if Joe Biden were to lose, he would become a lame duck president. And you know what he would do? He would do what every other lame duck president has done. They can't get in real trouble no more. They ain't got to get votes no more, so they'll start signing pardons. They'll do everything they can to get their agenda carried out in the last time that they have left knowing that their days are almost finished. Could I tell you that Satan may be a big braggadocious outfit, but he already knows his days are finished. And he's doing everything he can between right now and the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory to disrupt and to destroy and to care down. But I got news for you. The truth is that Jesus is now the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we are simply here awaiting his return in the clouds of glory. Now the problem is if you share in Satan's rebellion, you also share in his destruction. Last time we'll see him, Revelations 20, and the devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is not the kind of company I want to keep. There's a God, there's a devil. That's a binary truth. There is a heaven. Anybody here want to go to heaven? We're not getting a load up right now. Don't worry. But should he split the eastern skies, I'm getting on the first cloud out of here. I want to go to heaven. And I got news for you. Some of you are like me, bald, gray, and everything else like that. The older you get, the more you want to believe in heaven. When you look around, you check your birthdays, and when you look at the obituaries and find that you're not there, that's good. But you start saying, oh, I know him. I grew up with him or her. Oh, I went to school with that person. And, and they're dying left and right. You realize that you better hope there's something more than what this world has to offer. I believe in a place called heaven. I'm here to tell you, I believe I got a grandmother there who kept me when my mother was having my little brother in the hospital in Birmingham, Alabama, East End Memorial. And she stayed and she cooked for me. Oh, God, she was a terrible cook. She cooked hamburgers and she, they, they, they looked like they'd been brought out of a, a, a coal fire when she got through them. They were so crunchy and crisp on the outside. But this little burr-headed boy loved every one of them. And she's gone on to meet Jesus. My dad died this August, just a few days from now, in 1982. So what is that, 41 years ago? I said goodbye to my dad on a Wednesday, drove back to Georgia, and had to turn around on Saturday and go back. He's gone. My, my little mother will turn 97 this week. I don't know how much longer she's going to be here in this world, but I had her the other day. I was over there to see her, and they had somebody singing in the, in the kitchen, not the kitchen, the dining room area, and they were all out there. And uh, I, me and my wife were sitting over and when they, in, in the living room part of the, of the assisted living home. And when she came over, I said, oh, Mama, wasn't that some good singing? She said, yes, yeah, son. I had to speak in tongues just a little bit while ago. <laughs> I told my daughter, my oldest daughter, Christy, down at Hinesville, she said, Daddy, the thing I remember about my nanny, she's been through some stuff, man. She had some potassium drop out, mag magnesium drop out, fell and hit her head. And, and God, have mercy. The way she talked, I, I had never heard that in 70 years. But, but, but she got through that. She's back speaking in tongues now, not speaking in sailor. <laughs> if you don't understand that, talk to me after church and I'll tell you. But, but Christy said, oh, Daddy, I, the thing I remember about, I, I've heard my nanny pray 
and I've heard her pray in tongues. So let me tell you something. I got all kinds of reasons to go to heaven. I love my wife's dad. He died leaving this, he left this world just after holding up a feeble hand on the deathbed singing, holy God's unchanging hand. I want to tell you, I, I believe there's a place that's called heaven. The Bible talks about three of them. I've been in one of them. I, uh, the Bible says, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether he's in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. Such a one was caught up in the third heaven. I've never been there. If you don't know what the three heavens are, the one is the, the sky above us. That's called a heaven. The second is the starry expanse that's above us. I can't get there right now. But there's a third heaven. And it's the abode of God the Father. Mortal eyes and mortal men have not been there except in dreams and visions and revelations. Paul and John saw it. They saw it in glimpses. Just visions and rapture of beauties and they began to reveal to us them. Now the Bible says it's the city of God. But you know what? It was built with you in mind. God doesn't need it. He's not preparing heaven for himself. He's putting it together for you. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. That don't mean you're going to get a big standalone mansion. I don't want to bust your bubble. It means in my Father's house are many rooms. When I go home, I don't say, Mom, I'm going to stay across town. I go back there to that bed I slept in since I was 13 years old, and I plop down there in my Father's house because in my Father's house there's a room, and it's always there, and it's always prepared. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. You cannot believe in heaven if you want to, but I'm looking forward to streets of gold gates of pearl and walls of jasper. I'm looking forward to look. Oh my God, I feel the Holy Ghost in my soul today. I'm looking forward to looking. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you, I'm preaching. I'm, I'm, I'm on the rabbit trail again. There's a throne there. And he that sits upon that throne is like a sardius stone. That means a brilliant burning red. And that throne is white. And behind that, there is a rainbow, not the one that the uh, other people use today. An emerald green rainbow. And in front of it, there is a sea of glass. I want to go to this place. And he that's sitting on the throne is like a sardis stone. Gates with pearl, walls of jasper, diamond, streets of translucent gold, and him sitting on the throne is like a light that no man can approach to. Now you just think about it. There's a city built with 12 stories, 12 foundations, each foundation a precious stone, and the only thing separating them is translucent gold. <laughs> We used to sing, what will it be when we get over yonder and join the throng upon that glassy sea to see our loved ones and crown Christ forever? Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. If you ladies got a diamond on your finger when you get home and some good light, put it up there and, and watch what happens when that light hits it. And then think with me for just a moment. There's a city that God is building for you that's 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long. It's filled with every precious stone that ever existed, translucent gold and a green emerald and a white throne and a fiery God. And as his light hits the city, it must be the light of refraction like no man has ever seen, like the greatest diamond you could ever find will not begin to emit the fire and glow and glory of one mind 
minute seconds in the presence of the eternal God, you can sit around and say, I'm not wasting my time. I, I'm not either, friend. You may say, I'm not wasting my time serving Jesus, but I'm looking for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. And he said, you can come to that place if you will. Somebody give him praise in this house. My God, the preacher came with me today. There's a heaven. It's prepared for me and you. But then there's this other part. Next slide. There's, there's hell. He don't want you to talk about hell anymore. We don't preach about it. We don't talk about it. The most unpleasant part of the gospel, which the gospel means good news. Good news is there's a God. There's a devil. You've got to know that. Can't overcome evil if you don't know what evil is. There's a heaven. That's great. Oh, there's a hell. It's described for us pretty clearly in the, in the Bible. Those, those words, I don't even like the sound of them. There's a hell. Let me just tell you real quickly. I don't have time to read all these scriptures. But it's a place of, it's a place of torment. My God, is it? Oh, I'm going to watch this upside down. I thought I'd done preached at 1230. I was about to have a heart attack. It's a place of torment. You know where Lazarus went? Uh, not Lazarus, but the rich man. He said, Father Abraham, listen, listen to this, because I'm going to come back to this. He said, could you tip, dip your finger? Uh, he, could, he, could Lazarus just dip his finger in water? Could he, could he just take a, a bottle of warm water and do this? That don't do nothing for me. But I ain't never been to hell. I'm in torments in these flames. You know the story. He can't come to you. You can't come to me. You had your chance. Ooh, 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 ooh that rubber's tough, wasn't it? He said, you had your chance. It's a place of eternality. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, where the fire is not quenched, and the worm dieth not. A lot of people think that word worm means soul, but it doesn't mean that. It literally means a worm. Specifically, the kind that preys upon dead bodies. Doesn't sound like a, the kind of place I want to go. Fire, worms. It's a place, but, but this is hell. Somebody said, do you think the fire ever burn up? Or you think we were, I, I don't know about any of that stuff. I just read what the Bible says. But I do know this. It is a place of separation from God. You may think you don't need it. You may be here this morning and say, well, he's not in my life. Oh, but he's keeping you alive. Yes. Then he'll say to those on the left hand, pardon me, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Last verse is not a terrible verse. It's a verse of hope. Hell was not bit with me in mind. God never intends for me to go there. I don't have to go there. It was prepared for the devil. It's prepared for those angels that he drew down from heaven when they rebelled against God. You don't have to go. I, I, I'm, I'm not thankful that my wife was as sick as she was. And we've told you the story. If you weren't here to hear it, I don't have time to tell it again. But 99 days in the hospital. They'd moved her from Brunswick to Savannah. In the Savannah hospital we were in, it was hot. It was always hot in there. It was uncomfortable. So, you know, not thinking. I brought a bottle of water with me. My wife looked at me one day. I turned this thing up just like this. drink some water. So she gulped that stuff down. <laughs> but on that day, my wife had not had a drink of water in 60 days. 60 days. Water had not touched her lips or her tongue. Can you just imagine that? 60 days 
We some people say, I don't like water. Well, if you didn't have none, you'd like it. And she looked over at me. It was just one of the saddest days I ever lived. And said, she had a trachea. Good. Could you give me some of your water, please? I never again brought a, a bottle of water in there that she could see. Because I just tell you, that would like to kill me. I thought, the, I instantaneously thought of a rich man in hell. And it's not 60 days now. It's not 60 years. It's thousands of years. Saying, could I have one? Try. Could I have just one? So much that we take for granted as the bounty of God we'll miss. He separated. That, that hit me, and I don't think I'll ever forget it, but, but another time I was in there along the same lines, and I think I've told you this, but uh, this separation from God thing. Now, we've been married, we'll be married this September, 50 years. Now, I know we too, I'm too young. To be married 50 years, but she's way too young to be married 50 years. We were in the room with her, and she's laid on the bed. She was in and out of coherency, if that's the word. Sometimes she knew what was going on. Sometimes she couldn't give a flying flip and a whirlwind what was taking place. She looked at me. I looked over at her. I was tired. I had been there day after day after day after day. I don't, as a pastor, I'd go to the hospital. I guarantee you, you don't have to worry about no long visit from me. I come and hey, I love you. I'm here to pray for you. <laughs> and we might talk a minute, and then I'm gone. If I was going to stay, I took her because she could talk to people. I didn't. You think I could talk to anybody? But I sometimes get tired of that. So. I'd been there all day, every day, day after day. I was tired. I was exhausted. I'd been sleeping in a bed alone when I hadn't slept in a bed alone for 48 years. I mean, it just, things were different. And I looked over at her. I looked at my daughter, Kimberly, and I said, Are you ready to go? She said, yeah. And I looked over at my wife and I said, Babe, baby, I think we're going to go on home now. Not a word. Just, of course, me being quick-witted preacher said, you know what, I think we're going to stay a little while longer. <laughs> but that don't work in hell. Separated from loved ones, from family, but most of all, separated from God. There, there's, a, there's a heaven I won't tear here any longer because people say y'all not preach on this stuff, but I'm going to tell you somebody has to. The most terrible words you will ever hear in your life if you hear them are when the God of this universe looks down and says, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never Well, what do we do about it? Well, man is a sinner. And sin is what separates us from God. Amen? We, we, we make very light of it now, but it's not light. The Bible said, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord called to Adam and said, Where are you? <laughs> He'd been in my home when I was a boy growing up. Where are you? What are you doing? Anybody ever hear that? So he said, Well, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that? Have you eaten from the tree in which I commanded you you should not eat? And the man said, Well, this is people now. He said, that woman you gave me, she did it. Right? But I want you to know if he'd asked the woman, first she said, it was Adam's fault. 
He should have told me better. We love to blame our failures on everybody but the person responsible. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden. Well, he said, first the woman said, you gave it, and you shall leave this tree, and I ate. And then the Lord sent him out of the garden to till the ground. He drove out the man. He placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way. Man was separated from God because of sin. Sin's not a toy. It's not a game. If you're a teenager, it's not a game you play. Thinking it won't matter if you win or lose. You see, this... Th this, 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 this is not a practice field. This is it. The decisions you make today affect you eternally. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, some Eastern religion say if you don't get it right in this life, you can come back and get it right again. No. You better get it right today. Because the next coming back is going to be in a twofold place, heaven or hell. I was a sinner. I don't like songs that say I'm just a sinner saved by grace. If you like them, sing them. I'll play them for you, but I might not sing with you. I was a sinner. But I've been transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Does that mean you don't sin? I'm not perfect. I've done things in my life since I got saved. I'm ashamed of, embarrassed. I won't tell you about them. Not, not horrific things. But sin is sin. And it separates. And let me tell you about Adam and Eve's sin. You, they wasn't a thing in the world wrong with eating a piece of fruit. And it, the Bible doesn't say it's an apple, by the way. Just a piece of fruit. I don't know what it was. The sin was, God said, don't do it. Now listen to me closely. My wife says you always do this when you want to make a point. I was telling something this morning. She said, you got that hand going. Well, I'm going to give you this hand today. If you don't believe what God says, then you will do what he forbids you to do. I'm going to say it again. That's a little different than the way we normally talk. If you don't believe what he says, it's not that you won't do what he says, it's that you will do what he says not to do. Adam and Eve's sin was rebellion against God. That sin that was in the garden is still the same. I talked about it last week and I said I wasn't going there again, but I, I will tell you, people are full of this mentality that says, I'm not doing what nobody tells me to do. Well, you better do what God tells you to do. You better hear him and hear his words. Mankind doesn't believe God. A, a lot of mankind, uh, some of the prominent countries, Western countries that used to be, and I talked about this, I guess, last week, used to be, maybe it's on the prayer call. Uh, between the prayer call and preaching, I don't ever know what I've said and where I've said it. But some of the prominent countries of Western Europe that have crosses on their flags are majority atheists today. Great Britain, where people came here for the sake of the gospel. Columbus, who discovered America, and they want to crucify him today, and he may have done some terrible things, but he said, I'm going for the sake of the gospel. The pilgrims came here for the sake of the gospel. Now, we live in a state that was founded by a lot of penal colony people, so we ain't got nothing to brag about. But I tell you what, John Wesley and Charles Wesley came here for the sake of of the gospel. This country is here because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible said the fool has said in his heart there is no God. But do you realize that word there is not in the original translation? It says the fool hath said in his heart no God. That could mean there is no God, but it also could mean, uh, tell me to sit down and shut up. Go on. No. So, when I read that, I think of God calling to you and to you and to me and beckoning for us to come to Him and follow Him and us saying, no. 
I heard a little thing at youth camp. Not youth camp. It was youth camp for, for, for board members. We went to French Lake, Indiana. And it had a little guy who, who, who put on a little coat, and he used his hands. He's behind his head. He used his hands to feet, so he'd go up at this high. And he had another guy behind him, wrapped around him. That was using hands. His name was Rufus, character name, Rufus T. Shag next to him. And I still remember what he says. You know, there's a word in the Bible called psaltery, P-S-A-L-T-R-Y. But Rufus didn't pronounce it like that. He called it pizzle tree. He said, one day Jonah was in his backyard picking pizzles off his pizzle tree. And the Lord said to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. And he, he must, Jonah must have been a southern guy because he said, and Jonah said, I ain't neither. Do you realize what chaos and ruin that almost caused? When one man said, no, God. No, God. Man is a sinner, and he doesn't like the fact that he's a sinner. So we say, you're lost and you need Jesus. No, I'm fine by myself. Mankind doesn't believe God. Doesn't believe he exists. Doesn't believe he's a sinner. Man's a sinner. But God does exist. And because he loved me and because he loves you, he provided a way. Man is a sinner, but Jesus is a Savior. How many are saved and you know you're saved today? I know I'm saved. I don't know a lot in this world, but I know I'm saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believed in him should not perish have everlasting life. You can argue moral goodness if you want to. But moral goodness will not save you. I know a lot of good people, but they don't know Jesus. Well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. So does the devil. He's going to hell. It's not do you believe in him, but have you trusted in him? Jesus is the Savior of the world. The Bible said the kindness and love of God appear toward us not by works of morality, not by works of righteousness, not because I did more good than I did evil, not by any of those things that I have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He washed us with the washing of, the, of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You know, I hear people say, but I'm a good person. I had not done anything wrong. Well, what about Adam and Eve? They just had an apple snack or an orange snack or some other snack. And God drove them out of the garden. God, you know, I've always said that, you know, we say Adam and Eve are naked, and I know they were, but I've always believed that they were covered. I believe they were covered with the glory of God. It didn't bother them to walk with God. Because their, their nakedness and nudity was not revealed. Now, that, that may, that's just my philosophy. You don't have to believe that. But I believe the instant they bit into that fruit together, that that covering of glory left them. And the merciful God that we serve could have said, I've had it, I gave you a chance, you blew it, you're gone, you're through. But no, he didn't do that. He took the skins of animals, which means he had to take something and kill it and shed its blood and take the skin of it and cover them. And I got news for you. Man has walked in that naked condition ever since and looking for something to cover up who he was. But one day, oh, hallelujah, one day on Calvary, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world gave his life, shed his blood, and we can again be covered by the glory of God. Amen. He covered me. He took my guilt. He took my shame. See, and he took my shame. The Bible said he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And about the ninth hour, darkness came over the earth. We love to believe that it was because God turned his back. I don't know that that's what happened. I know he can't look on sin and his own son who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And on that cross, as the sky was dark, Jesus cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which if you interpret it, comes out in the Aramaic to say, my God, 
my God. Here's that separation again. Why have you forsaken me? I'm going to tell you, the worst part of hell won't be the fire. The worst part of hell will be his God's not there. No wonder David, when he sinned, he said, oh God, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. And don't take your presence away from me. No wonder when Jesus came, gave his life. But before he did that, when he was about to be born, the angel said, call his name Jesus. For he will save his people. Last slide. There's a God. There's a devil. There's a heaven. There's a hell. Man is a sinner. Jesus is a savior. But here's the clutch. Here's the piece that binds all that together. You got to decide. You have to decide. Whether you're two or a hundred and two, there'll come a time in your life you will have to make the choice. You ever known people who felt like if they didn't, if they just, just ignored something, it would go away? You can't ignore God. You can't ignore the gospel. If you don't believe in the God, there's a God, it won't change the fact that He is. If you don't believe there's a devil, that won't destroy the plans that He has to wreck your life. If you don't believe there's a heaven, it won't detract one bit from its beauty when I shout down those streets of gold. You can believe there's no hell, but that'll never cool your parched tongue should you go there. You say, well, I'm not a sinner. I don't believe that I'm a sinner. But I won't do you one bit of good when you stand before the king of the universe to be judged. You don't have to believe that Jesus is the Savior. But it won't prevent Him from saving anyone and everyone that go to the Father in His precious and lovely name. But the Bible says, and this is one of the greatest scriptures in the Word of God. If you don't want to learn, a lot of them learn this one. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you hadn't done that, you're not saved. Coming to this church didn't save you. Joining didn't save you. Being baptized in water didn't save you. It was confessing Jesus as Lord of your life. And confessing that you're saved. You know, you know what the word confess there means, and I'm about through. It doesn't mean you go down to the altar and start telling everything you've done to everybody there. We don't want to know. We kind of like you like you are. Please don't tell us everything you've ever done in your life. You know what it means to confess my sins? It doesn't mean to make a list of them. Con that word confess there means to agree with God. You know what God said? I'll tell you what God said. All have sinned and come short of the glory. So for me to confess my sins is simply to agree with God that I'm a sinner. I had a time in my life. I gave my heart to the Lord at about six. Got baptized with the Holy Ghost when I was 11. Was doing pretty good until I hit those teenage years. Now, I went to church. I played the piano. I probably sang. We shouted and fell out and did everything else. But I had those times when I looked at my life and said, God ain't pleased with this. God is not pleased with where you're living. You know, you fall in with the wrong crowd or the wrong person. They'll lead you in the wrong direction. I thank God I had enough of the Holy Ghost in me to not go to some things that I could have not, not go as far with some things as I could have gone. Thank God for the presence. You say it's not important that you get, it's important you give your heart to the lie. God, as quick as you can. Yesterday was too late. But I'm struggling as a 17 year old. And I, I'll, I'll never forget this. I remember my pastor was preaching, and he preached on 1 John 1 and 9. 
Jimmy Smith. He's been an overseer. He's been evangelism director. He's done all kinds of things. He's a good friend of mine. He's a little older than I am. We used to double date together. He, he, he dated this girl in church, and I dated his sister, which she's about two years older than me. But he was a girl. That's all I was interested in right then. So we double dated again. But he went off and came back as our pastor. And I was struggling, man. I was struggling. I, I, I had to live for God. My testimony in my school was that I was a Christian. People knew it. I was standing somewhere one time in a place I worked. I worked when I was in high school. And one lady at the cashier at Gentry's Big Star said, I ain't never seen a real Christian. And a star football player on the football team was standing right beside me. He said, well, look right there. Well, you can't get a higher honor than that. But at this moment in my life, I wasn't, I don't know about then, but I wasn't worthy of that. And I'd pray, I'd go down the altar and I'd pray a little bit and I'd say, God, help me, help me do better this week. I don't want to tell you what I did last week. I, please help me, God. You know, unless you get away from what's putting you down, you're not going to do no better. But he preached that night. And he preached First John 1 and 9. And I'll never forget this. I went down that altar. And you might need to do that. Or you might need to do it in the seat where you are. But I went down that altar and I said, My pastor preached today, Father, that if I had confessed my sin, you'd forgive me of my sin and cleanse me. And God... If I don't ever feel your touch again, you said it, I've done it, and I believe it, and I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. Did you get an epiphany? No. Did you shake, shimmy, and shudder? No. I got a hold of what God said he would do for me. If you'll agree with me, son, that you've sinned, I'll forgive you. And he did. And 6,000 something sermons later, I'm standing here today. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit. The great three in one. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Come with me, sweetie. Huh? Okay. You got it? Uh, uh. Just a couple of months from now, we'll be 19, 20, 21, 22, four years ago. Just stay seated. I'm not going to keep you much longer. We are going to have a time of prayer and some things to do. But uh, since I got this woman in gear this morning, I want to I want to work her. The only negative to that is you have to listen to me. We were retiring from Fountain of Life Worship Center in, the, in West Virginia. This was a song that we sang over and over and over again. And they said, Brother Luke, would you sing that song one more time? So this is a theme song for us. We haven't got to sing it much because of my wife's situation. But if you know it, you can sing it with me. As long as I have breath, I will praise you. As long as I can see, I will sing your praise wherever you lead me. I will follow you as long as I have.
the gospel. You may not be called to preach. You don't have to be called to preach. But if you're called a Christian, you're put in this world to carry the gospel. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of every particular part of it. If the world doesn't like a part of it, don't change the gospel. I want us to pray. I know we got to pray for kids just in a moment. So I want to do this this way. I don't want to keep you too much later. And I want to spare that. But I don't know the spiritual status of everybody in this room. But when, when I was in North, uh, West Virginia, they, they're a little bit different there than it is here. They country folks like us. But they, they do things different. Now, has, has anybody ever been to an Ash Wednesday service here? You have? Good. They all go there. It's not just the Catholics. It's not just the Episcopals. Everybody goes. We all come together. And they, they burn some uh, palm fronds and get ashes and fill the oil. And, and people come down and preachers line up. Take their finger and dip it in the ash and dip it in the oil. And I thought this all strange, man. I was hoping God wouldn't strike me dead because I wasn't sure this was Pentecostal or not. But I, 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 I learned to love it. We put our finger in the ash and the oil and put the symbol of a cross on a person's forehead. Here's what we would say. Repent and believe the gospel. It, uh, Darren, that, that had an impact. We were put into this world to share the gospel. Now, I know you can put a bunch of stuff around it. You can elaborate on any one of those things that I said up there. But that's the gospel. So I want us to pray. And I want you to pray out loud with me. Because if you're here and you don't know Jesus, and if I close this sermon after preaching what I preached and don't give you a chance to know Jesus, then I have failed in all that I've done today. Maybe everybody's saved, and I hope you are, but i tell you what we can all do. And this is not my favorite way to do it because I believe sometimes you have to declare who you are. But I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Everybody, out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for dying. Thank you for rising again and being my intercessor. I believe the gospel. I know I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I know you are the Savior. I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my life. I believe you died for me. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. From this moment on, for the rest of my life, I will live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Put your hands together and let's praise Him right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus.